and gentlemen, and welcome to the Cambridge Union Society. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to welcome David Miliband here to Cambridge uh, in association with POLIS, the Department for Politics and International Studies. David will begin in conversation with Professor Andrew Gamble, who is the head of POLIS uh, and the first politics professor at Cambridge. Thank you very much to you. I think everybody knows uh, David Miliband, so there's no need to introduce him, but uh, obviously he was Foreign Secretary in the last government. I think I first uh, uh, met David when he was uh, uh, Secretary of the uh, Social Justice Commission at uh, IPPR. Um, so he's had long uh, experience in British politics. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we're going to uh, throw it open uh, to a general discussion for all your questions to David. But I'm going to start off with some, uh, some broad questions to David, just to get the ball rolling. So, the first question, um, looking at uh, some, some questions about the, uh, the international situation that we're, that we're facing. And, and I want, the first question I've, I've got, David, is uh, Iran. And the... Uh, Iran looks like one of the most serious problems that we've got to deal with uh, this year. What's your, um, what's your view of it and, 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 and what, what, should, uh, what should governments be, uh, how should they be approaching the Iran problem? Well, you're right to say that across the Middle East there's absolute uh, tumult, uh, a democratic surge like which the world's and the Middle East has never seen. And Iran has been if you like, a bit part player in this wave of democratization in the Middle East. A bit part in the sense that it does sponsor groups like Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. It's closely tied to the Syrian regime, the last backer of the Syrian regime. Uh, it comes from us in, it supports from us in Gaza. But it's been a, really a bit part player. It's been surprised by the democratizing wave. But of course, if you think about it, Iran itself had a democratizing halfway in 2009 with the so-called Green Movement. Now, I assume you're talking about the Iranian nuclear program. Yeah. So in that in particular, my own view is it would be very, very dangerous indeed for Iran to become a nuclear power, a nuclear weapon state. Uh, the world is rightly determined to stop Iran from becoming a nuclear weapon state. But the only thing as dangerous potentially as dangerous as Iran becoming a nuclear state, is an attack on Iran that starts a regional conflagration that I think will be a very, very long lasting. Now, how do we avoid that? I think that the sanctions that are being deployed, the pressure that's being applied, it is right. Because Iran is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it's clearly, according to the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Authority, flagrantly in violation of its responsibilities not to allow uh, the leakage of civilian nuclear power uh, program into a military use. It's flagrantly in breach of that, and it's right to have the sanctions. However, I'm absolutely convinced the Iranians will never agree to halt their program purely under pressure. There's got to be an engagement track that gives them a way out, and a way out without humiliation. And that way out, I think, hasn't really properly been tried. The truth is that the engagement track was half started by President Obama in early 2009, but it got killed off, really, by the internecine warfare within the Iranian regime in 2009. And so I would say that alongside the pressure track, you need an engagement track with all levels of Iranian society, because it's one of the most complex governing systems. And the one actor that has never previously been in the game, the people of Iran, is asserting itself in a way as never before. Um, let's, so that's that, then. We solved that. <laughs> I'm sure that people will be able to come back and ask, ask further questions about that later on. Um, what about China? Um, I mean, China is a, is a, uh, a huge and increasing presence in, our, in, 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 in world politics. Um, what should be the strategy towards China, how should we engage with, with China in the, in, in the coming decades? Well, I always say to people that there are really four major global forces that are reshaping uh, the world. Uh, 
one of which I mentioned, which is this civilian surge, this democratizing surge around the world. Uh, the second uh, is the shift from resource plenty to resource scarcity, which is maybe something that we will come back to. The third is the rise of political Islam, which I think is a fantastically important and significant development uh, that reshapes uh, global politics. But the fourth, which in a way underlies everything else, is the shift of power from West to East. The, the statistic I think brings this home to me is that over the next 20 years, 50 to 70 million people a year are going to join the global middle class in India and China. People are going to go from having incomes below $6,000 a year to between $6,000 and $18,000. 50 to 70 million a year. The world has never seen the, that speed of economic uh, transformation. The Economist had a piece like a couple of weeks ago saying that Iran, and that Iran, that China's going to become the biggest economy in the world by 2018. Whether you think it's 2018 or 2025 or 2030, this is a fundamental shift, and it affects every other part of the world. Because they're active in Africa, on the resource base, they rely on the Iranians actually for oil. Uh, how do we engage with them? I think that the only way to, to do that, really, is, is, is a twin track. One is really to understand the respect that China is seeking in the international community. Uh, and that respect is, is double-edged. They want, on the one hand, for their achievements to be admired, but they also want to be left alone when it comes to their own internal affairs. And that raises some quite difficult issues that we'd like them to uh, come back to. The second is that I think we have to bet that in the end, the Chinese will perceive it to be in their national interest for there to be a strong multilateral system, not a weak one. I think it's really interesting to think about the climate change issue. Historically, international climate change agreements have been blocked by the Americans and by the Chinese, both of which, and I suppose to some extent by the Indians, all of them very leery of international imposition on their own domestic choices. I think what happened in Durban in December of last year, when the Chinese basically shifted position and said, we do want an international agreement, is very significant in the international climate agreement. And it's significant because it, it suggests that they think it's in their own national interest, and they also think that they can pressure the Americans to do that route. And so my own view is that the Chinese will be, they think more deeply and more strategically, I think, than any democratic system about the long-term interests of their, of their one-party state. And that they have this sort of sense of the, the survivalist imperative. Now, I think they will come to believe that a strong group rather than a weak international system, a multilateral system, is in their interest. And I think that that's something we, we as the UK have a massive interest in pursuing. But I think at the West we do as well. Okay, well, completing this grand tour of the, uh, of, of, of the globe, um, we're in the middle of a, uh, well, at the beginning of a, of a US presidential election. Um, it's looking as... Uh, after yesterday as though Romney will be the, the challenger to Obama. There's a lot of uncertainty about where America is heading, uh, uh, whether America still has the political will to uh, exercise leadership. In, in the past, the UK has been criticised for being too close to the United States. What's your view of, of the role of the United States going forward and Britain's relationship to the United States? Well, I think, let me just say something about the election, because I think it is interesting. You see, in the American political system, there is this, what some people call, there's an asymmetrical polarization going on, mm. in that the Republican Party has moved very sharply to the right. Uh, I think much further to the right than Democrats have moved to the left, actually. <coughs> so you've got this polarization going on, but you've also got a situation where both sides start every presidential election with 47% of the vote. It's unheard of for either any of any presidential candidate to get less than 47%. So you're fighting over a very small centre ground. Now, Obama, President Obama slightly reshaped the arithmetic by getting so many young voters uh, engaged. But you're still basically 47% each before you, before you get going. There's not that many votes up for grabs. And that sense that it's a gridlocked democracy is very, very <coughs> serious. I mean, whoever wins, no one believes that you're going to have straightforward executive power. It's a system, after all, that's founded 200, 
200 odd years ago to block government doing things, it's very successful at blocking government, uh, <laughs> nationally and internationally. But the fear of executive power has, has created a sort of what I call frenetic rhythm. So it's not just like a traffic jam where no one's moving, everyone's moving, but no one's actually going in any coherent uh, direction in a lot of these policy areas, and that's, that's dangerous. My own view is that America doesn't want to spend the next 10 years engaged in the world. It wants to spend the next 10 years engaged in its own affairs. I actually think that's quite dangerous, but I think that if you talk to people on the centre-right, um, but also on the centre-left, they will say, internationalists as well, people who've been in foreign service, and get, they'll say it's not about America's stomach for engagement, it's that the priority, there must be Americans in the audience that here today, so it's interesting to hear their views, that there is a feeling that the domestic concerns are so pressing. Education, which America is having a crisis of confidence about, not university education particularly, but uh, secondary education. Um, healthcare, still an unsolved problem with 18% of national income being spent. <coughs> Um, their own economic uh, situation, the competitiveness of the American industry. These are really pressing domestic problems. So I think that internationally, America is indispensable. That's what President Obama said in his statement. But it's not clear that they're going to be wanting to dispense that power very proactively. They will where their vital interests are engaged. They're making some quite big moves in terms of the Pacific. Um, but I think that. If you had to bet, you'd say America is going to be a latecomer rather than a, a starter when it comes to global initiatives and things. And personally, I think that's dangerous. Okay. Let's let's turn to uh, nearer home. Let, let's turn to Europe and the and the, the crisis in the eurozone. Um, what's your what, what what what's your view of of this crisis? How can it be resolved? And is it is it dangerous that uh, for British policy, that Britain appears to be uh, moving to the sidelines of, uh, of the European Union. I mean, I think that it's really important to understand essentially a small Greek economic problem, 50 billion euro economic problem, which is not, not very much money if you think about it in the, in the context of a European economy that's a 6, 8, 10 trillion euro economy, uh, has become an existential problem for the European Union. Because the prospect of a fracture of the of the euro it is deeply threatening to the whole of the, the European project. Now, I think what's going to happen actually is that the euro probably won't fracture. Greece may Greece will Greece needs to default, but it will either default in the system or there'll be a very very organised exit for Greece. I don't I don't consider that to be a sort of dangerous fracture. But if that if, if if I'm right, essentially at least a 16 member euro continues, there's one consequence of that which relates to the same question, which is there's no question that you're going to have a strong club within a club. The Euro members, the 16, are going to be in an absolutely dominant position for policy for the 27 members of the EU as a whole. And this is something that British policy has tried to avoid for 40 years. So it's it's very, very serious. You see in the late 90s, people, some people argued we should join the euro because if we didn't, we'd lose out for the rest of European business, whether it's on the single market, on energy, on migration. That actually hasn't proved to be correct. You could actually make an argument that in, by 2008, Britain was in a much more uh, dominant position in European policy making than it was in 1998, uh, on a whole range of issues, actually. Uh, economic as well as the social and environmental issue. Now, what I fear is that if if the euro is rescued, and in the end there's some kind of joint and several liability for debts, there's some kind of expanded role of the ECB, uh, there is a proper growth package for the short term to get us through to the two or three years down the line when some of the structural reforms can come to have an effect, then the consequence will be that the, the, those who have successfully saved the euro will want to march on, not just in terms of the way the 16 or 17 organise themselves, but in the way the rest of the European Union plays in. Uh, uh, personally, I think for Britain to become a uh, in the second division or third division of the European Union is very dangerous for us for the following reasons. One, we become agenda takers rather than agenda setters on the economic questions, and that's dangerous, including the single market. Secondly, 
I think that on the <coughs> other issues, foreign policy issues, alliances will, with Britain will become much more toxic. And then thirdly, I, I, I know that if you want Britain to be strong in Beijing or Washington or anywhere else, in, in capitals and foreign policy terms, strength in Europe is undoubtedly part of the part of our and so I, I'm personally think we're going to face some very, very difficult choices. Do you think our membership of the EU is, is threatened? Well, there's no question that the, there, there are significant numbers of Tory MPs now who want to uh, take them out of full membership of the European Union. Um, if you want to get selected as a Tory MP at the moment, you've got to have a pretty hard line on Europe to get to get yourself selected, I don't think there are some prospective Tory MPs in the audience, but the, uh, my advice to you uh, on the basis of talking to some of the people who are currently Tory MPs is if you stand up and say, yes, we've got to have an engaged and uh, relationship with the European Union, that's not going to win you your votes in the Tory selection conference. Um, and so I, I think what's going to happen, the danger, is that as the European Union does things that are perceived to be against the British national interest, people like me will say that's happening because we're in the second division. But people on the other side of the argument will say, no, it just shows you that Europe's not for us. And you, you can see a sort of conflagration coming. Okay. I mean, we, we've got problems with that union. We've also got problems with our other union, the, 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 the British Union, the, the United Kingdom. Uh, we now know there's going to be a referendum in Scotland in uh, 2014. Um, how do you think that's going to, going to play out? Do you think that... Uh, the, the, the unionist uh, forces seem to be on the back foot in the, uh, at, at, at the present time. Is there, uh, is, is there a way, uh, on the other hand, you've also got this strange phenomenon in the polls that uh, uh, more English voters seem to want to, to support Scottish independence than Scottish voters at the, at the present time. Um, what's that telling us about the, well, that, the state Europe, of the union? Europe, the, the Europe question and the Scotland question are, are related, actually. And both of them um, come down to whether or not there's a coherent view of mm. the future of the United Kingdom, mm. globally and internally. And, and I think that most Scots instinctively are not looking for independence, but they might vote for it if they feel there isn't a positive future for them within the union. And that's the key job for people who think, people like me, who think that the Union, the United Kingdom is, and, and the constituent units of the United Kingdom are stronger for being in the UK than, than outside. Um, but the, the, the battle has to be joined, and it, has to be, it can't be joined in a way that says, uh, you can vote for independence or you can have the status quo. It's going to have to be a vision of how the Union is going to develop, how the United Kingdom is going to develop, and why its constituent units are stronger than anyone else. I mean, the UK is different from every other federation or confederation or union anywhere else in the world because England is 85% of the union. That creates a, a situation that isn't replicated in any other. So people who say, you know, what about, isn't it odd that South Dakota has two seats in the Senate and so does California, and South Dakota has <coughs> citizens and California has 35 million. I mean, California is 35 million out of 300 million Americans. <coughs> Whereas in the UK, you've got this oddity that the, or not oddity, but, um, unique situation that England is 85%. And England, England's uh, constituent units <coughs> are, are, are disempowered, not by Scottish devolution, but by centralization of power at Westminster. And I actually think the government, the current government, are doing, having these mayoral referendums in cities, I think that's a good thing. As long as it goes with more power for cities. Because the sense of disempowerment of English voters, in the end, it is actually a, an anti-Westminster thing, just like the Scots, actually. Not an anti-enemy in my view. Okay. And then, um, perhaps as a final question, um, to go over uh, and, and, and to wrap a, n a number of, of things together. Uh, since the, the 2008 crash, um, politics is dominated by, um, by austerity, by prospects of uh, um, slow growth. Uh, there's huge concerns about where growth is going to come from. We've got a major debate about um, what the state is for, what the, 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 the scope and role of the state, what public services are for, can we afford public services any longer? Uh, these are big questions for all political parties, but particularly for the centre-left, and the centre-left isn't doing very well um, in elections across, 
across Europe. Um, these, these appear to be a very particular, uh, a, a new set of, circum of, of political circumstances which uh, political parties, politicians have to, uh, are having to grapple with. What, what do you think are the, the main things that a, uh, um, a party of the centre-left should be trying to, to, to do? What, what, what policies should it be putting forward in order to deal with this set of... Uh, That's a very, very, very interesting problems. question. Look, first of all, there is, there is a crisis in the centre-left. 24 of 27 European governments are governed from the centre-right. That is a big fact. Um, and there are two responses within the Labour Party to this. Uh, I've written an article in the New Statesman tomorrow about this. One, one, one view, which is Roy Hatter's lead, former deputy leader, has written about it. Uh, I call it sort of reassurance Labour. And essentially the argument is, we've been proved more right than we could ever have imagined by the financial crisis, so what we've got to do is shout louder about what we believe in and it will all come right. And I do not think this is a sensible strategy to start winning elections, because the truth is that what we need is not reassurance, but rethinking. Because the two qualifying conditions for any party to get out of opposition and into government are very simple. One, you've got to really understand why you lost. Really, really understand why you lost. And secondly, you've got to have some ideas that will make things better in the future. And just shouting about what you used to believe isn't going to actually do the uh, trick. I actually think that we have to rethink the role of government. Uh, we have to rethink the, how the international context flows in, because there's no question that the absence of international regulation and intervention were the pretty proximate causes of the um, financial crisis. But you can't click your fingers and get international agreement in the way that you can legislate in the national context. We've got to rethink how we uh, promote equality at a time, or at least equality of opportunity at a time when the <coughs> public spending is not going to be the main route to achieve it. And my own view is that, and in a funny way, the values of the centre-left, which are about solidarity, cooperation, um, are about equality, actually, equal worth, those are more relevant to an interdependent world than than 100 years ago. But you've got to put them into practice in radically different ways. And that's, I think, going to be the test. If, you, if the electorate think we haven't learned the lesson in 2010, when we were perceived to be <coughs> for a big status establishment, they, if they perceive that we haven't learned our lessons, and if they think we haven't got some big ideas and new ideas for the future, they're going to run into difficulty. And I think that's a challenge not just in Britain. It's, I, I met some people from Sweden actually uh, yesterday who are young um, spokespeople from the Swedish Social Democrats, the most successful Social Democratic Party in Europe in the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, they're having to do the rethinking as well because they're under threat from a sort of working class base that is fragmenting and a centre right that has become moderate on social issues. So essentially that's what's happened. That in, in the, uh, in the late 90s and the 2000s, the centre-left was winning because it was centre-left versus right. And then what happened around Europe is that the right moved to the centre on social issues, on gay rights and racial discrimination, a whole range of issues. And then it's now centre-right versus left. And essentially what happens then is you lose. If you're on my side, you lose. And uh, <laughs> so that's what we have to go re <laughs> okay, well that's, um, that's uh, uh, started us off, so now we're going to go into the, uh, in, in, into the question session, and David, you're going to, uh, you're going to take over. Yeah, you should work for some art design. Yep, yep, you're doing this, okay. Thank you for joining us for answering your questions. I actually have a, a, a serious question related to the Labour Party itself. Um, from 2001 to the current state of affairs in the Labour Party, Gordon Brown and Ed Balls have either bullied or sabotaged reforming movements within the Labour Party, a reform agenda, a prime minister who tried to take the Labour Party to a completely different level. So my question is, why hasn't anyone in the Labour Party stood up to them, taken them down, confronted them, <laughs> we have three questions at a time. But <laughs> I, think, I, I think I was thinking that's unfair. I mean, the uh, uh, I think that's unfair because 
uh, people have different views in politics, and you've got to be clear about them. I think the tragedy of Gordon Brown's premiership was that the, in a way, the weaknesses that were inherited from Tony were compounded, and the strengths that were inherited from Tony were thrown away. That's essentially why we got slaughtered, my side got slaughtered in 2010. Uh, and that is, and I use the word tragedy advisedly. Um, and I think that I think it's unfair on the balls. I think that he's done a lot actually for the party. Uh, and so, but, but there are, there is a, there's a healthy debate to be had in the party about where it goes. And I actually think that the, 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 this, the these questions speak to something the electorate sense. You see, one of the reasons I'm doing, I'm doing this sort of tour of different universities to talk to Labour students, but also students more generally. And essentially what I find is that politics as practiced at Westminster or as <coughs> doesn't do justice to the issues that students are studying in their own courses. Because you know that there are fundamental changes going on in the world and they're not really being reflected. The sort of things we've talked about don't get a kind, kind of airtime. Even the economic debate is 95% about what should be the macroeconomic stance of the government <coughs> now. But the truth is you can spend 10, 20, 30 billion pounds more in a Keynesian stimulus in Britain today. But there are still fundamental issues about how does a British economy compete in the, in the world. So those are now the purpose of saying that is that I actually think that within the Labour Party we could capitalise on that sense that politics is out of touch. And we can do so in a way I don't think it is have personality actually. I think that we can have a we can have a, a, a problem to play about it. So um, Um, there was uh, last year some speculation that the Tories might offer you the investor uh, role in, uh, in Washington. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you could speak to that, given, given that um, a brother uh, is not in the position that he is. But perhaps a more serious, more general question. Uh, what do you think of the utility of the Foreign Office, and what role do you think the Foreign Office can take in the future? Well, I hope some of you will go into the Foreign Office. I, I hope you join the diplomatic service. It's a fantastic thing to do. Um, but I would never go and be the ambassador, A, for a Tory government, because you're there as a sort of spokesman of the, of the government you have agreed with. And secondly, um, you don't want to be the, you don't want to be in a job that you used to boss around. <laughs> I mean, boss around, as I say, it's the nicest possible way I've ever boss around the British ambassador, whatever, but you know what I mean. You don't want to be in a position where you're, you know, you're an ambassador, I've been previously been in the foreign sector. For those of you who, for people like me who have who are politicians and have very strong political views, it, it will be, I think it's hard to win the civil service. I think one, other thing, one thing to say though is that there are diplomats, there are civil servants with very strong political views, but they haven't been politicians before, so, so they can serve governments of either party. I think one of, the, one of the sad things in the last six months is that the British embassy in Tehran has been closed. One of the great strengths of British diplomacy over the last 30 years, since the Iranian hostage crisis, is that actually we've been into it. I can't go into the details, but I've, successive, not just American governments, but other governments, have engaged with me and with our staff to understand Iran, because we're there. And, uh, sorry, I've got this, um, uh, the, 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 this but the, uh, that's something that we've got to keep up. We've got 261, now 260 missions around the world, it's really important that we, that we keep that up because it's part of our internationalism, part of what we bring to the international, to the international scene. <laughs> Do I have to answer the previous two questions again? Uh, yeah, maybe that. Hi. I'm sorry to hear <laughs> You've got any jobs going? I'm always open to it. <laughs> I mean, I think the truth is that you're not... The old division between domestic and foreign policy has basically collapsed. 
because so much of what you want to do domestically, whether on jobs or crime or you know, migration, depends on what you do abroad. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be aggressive abroad. I mean, the, uh, and the, the reason I'm worried about an America that is focused inwards is that basically none of the world's problems are going to be solved unless America's engaged. Well, no, but it's, look, you're the, you know, you're effectively the richest country in the world, you're the most powerful country in the world, and if America goes into a, I mean, it's not about isolationism, but if it goes into sort of introversion, we're not going to solve incredibly pressing moral problems. Um, I mean, to be fair, the, even at the end of the Clinton administration, I think I'm right to say 0.1% of the US government budget was spent on overseas aid. 0.1, I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, in this country, it's now we're up to 0.45, 0.47, we're heading to 0.7, which is the UN target. Now, aid on its own is not going to solve the crippling problems of a billion people around the world who are living on less than a dollar a day. But unless you have American money, markets, uh, engagement on conflict prevention, a whole range of other things, you're not going to solve these problems. And so uh, that, that's why America is an indispensable power. Now, China is becoming a, a, an indispensable power, but it's not going to be able to solve the problems on its own either. And it's a very difficult argument to make because people want local solutions. And in, in, in my country, in our country, we have an over-centralized government. That's not your problem. In, in America, you've got, you've got, if anything, the opposite problem. Um, but you, as well as localization, you need global engagement. And now, it, it, you can perfectly legitimately say, but America makes mistakes when it engages in the world, and that's true. But I, don't, I think if the lesson is we're bound to make mistakes, that's the wrong lesson. Yeah, sir. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I'm not just choosing Americans. I didn't know they were Americans. <laughs> You're all Americans. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's undercurrent of a lot of sort of these uh, foreign policy debates is really sort of the philosophical debate about what is the question, which is, so, do we really consider the right rights to be vested in sovereign states or in individuals? Um, I think this is a huge issue, especially with China and Russia um, on one side of the international system and America on the other. So I'm curious where you personally stand in this I think this is incredibly important. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, essentially, the world is governed by an idea that started in 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia, which is that national sovereignty means that states are able to do what they like within their own boundaries. And that was partly tempered by the UN Declaration on Human Rights uh, after the Second World War, which said that the abuse of rights, that, that all citizens had rights. But there was never really a mechanism to challenge states which abuse the rights of their own citizens. Now, what you're seeing at the moment in Syria is precisely the problem that you're identifying, which is that People like me who believe in humanitarian, that there are situations where humanitarian demand is such and the abuse of power is such that states should not be quote unquote sovereign to do what they like, are up against both autocracies, quasi democracies like Russia, or democracies like India who say the dangers of intervention are outweigh the responsibility to protect civilians. And that is the fundamental reason why you've got abuse of human rights around the world, why you haven't got a climate change deal around the world, why, you, why trade talks are stuck. This clash between an interdependent world and sovereign states is the problem. Now, I believe that we shouldn't write off the nation state. There isn't going to be global government in my lifetime. The nation state is still the, where political legitimacy resides. And that's a good thing. But you can't govern an interdependent world if states are able to abuse the rights of their own citizens or abuse the common the public commons globally, whether in, in the air, environmental, or in the seas, actually, because the governance of the seas is, a, is an epic tragedy that is being played out. Unless you're willing to say, sorry, you, you can't do what you like. Now, the world signed up in 2005 to something called the Responsibility to Protect. 180 countries said, if a state abuses the rights of its own citizens, then there's a responsibility on others to intervene. But actually, it's honored in the breach rather than the observance. I, I spent a bit of time working on the Sri Lanka issues, where at the end of the Civil War, there was mass murder of civilians. And essentially, we got voted down in the Human Rights Council by countries including India and South Africa, actually, 
who said, no, it's, a, it's an internal situation, you can't intervene. So you're right to say, to say that this is a, this is a really, really big issue. No. I think it's really, look, it's really interesting. They're, they're talking about Mrs. Le Pen getting 20% of the vote in um, the French election. I just did a, a fundraising lunch last week for something called the Anne Frank uh, Trust. And it's a terrible irony that the, the country that Anne Frank emigrated to from Berlin in the mid-1930s is now the country that is convulsed by a, a sort of Islamophobic party that has got 25% of the vote in the Dutch election. <coughs> so so the, 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 the danger of populism of the right in times of austerity, and you, know, you could argue that there's a potential of populism of the left, although you see that in Venezuela, you don't really see that in uh, Europe at the moment. Um, I think it's real. I don't think Labour is, um, I mean, if anything, we are accused of not wanting to talk about issues of immigration uh, as interest. I don't, I don't think that's a, I don't think we're, we're part of that. I think that. Um, I think the truth is that the, um, when uh, the European Union expanded in 2004, it was a great thing to entrench democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, eight countries came in, only three or five European countries um, agreed to the free movement of labor without a transitional period of seven or ten years, and we were one of them. And that had much bigger influx than we expected. And so you've got, I think the lesson is you've got to manage flows. I think what's interesting about the debate in this country, though, is that the, the, my, the, the immigration debate has been separated from the race debate. And it's been separated from the asylum debate. I mean, if you were here in 2005 or 2001, the immigration and asylum were just sort of conflated as being <coughs> issues. That, that, that's much less the case now. And also, because of this Eastern European issue, it's much less a race debate. I'm not saying the race debate is gone. So I think that, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I read that there was a study by an organization called Searchlight, which is a really brilliant anti-fascist organization, which did a report last February about the dangers of uh, right-wing extremism in Britain, and we shouldn't be complacent. But I, I, don't, I, don't, I think, to be fair, the, you know, the, the two main parties are not, are not fermenting that, the three main parties are not fermenting that. Enough. Yeah, at the top. Um, in your opinion, do you feel uneasy about the increasingly ingrained nature of political Islam within the democratization of the Middle East and not within the country's Arab Spring, but also in, say, Turkey? I mean, basically, no. I think we should be pleased about it. Because the alternative is sort of jihadism. And ten years ago, the, 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 the mantra being offered to people in the Middle East and elsewhere uh, was. Um, your problems, economic, social, are the result of oppression by the West, and the answer is global jihad. <coughs> now, political Islam is in significant part a response to that. Because it's saying, no, our problems, our problems in Egypt or in Syria are not Western created or Israeli created, they're actually our own creation. Because we've got unaccountable, kleptocratic, autocratic leaders who are leading our countries uh, nowhere. So I think the notion, and, and and some, pe some people who, who call themselves Islamists say, look, you've got Christian democratic parties in Europe, well, we're no different from that. I mean, I think one's got to be, one's got to be careful, one's got to look at it. But I basically think that, that the Turkish model you mentioned, uh, the leaders there, the party there, is trying to reconcile or trying to implement what it perceives to be a, a religious injunction to equal worth and to personal development in a secular, in the context of a secular state, which is, um, and it's trying to reconcile private religious choice with public, with, with, a, with a secular public realm. I, I, I'm basically positive about it. I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, dewy-eyed about it, because I think the issues in Turkey are actually less about Islamism and more about authoritarianism, <coughs> locking up journalists and things that are real issues. <coughs> there. I do want to say one word about Pakistan, though I don't know if there are people here from Pakistan. Because in a way, you could say, oh, that just shows, what's happening in Pakistan shows all the dangers of political Islam. I actually take the opposite view. I, I think the tragedy of Pakistan, which in some ways is the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous countries in the world, the tragedy of Pakistan is that either Islam has been used to beat up on democracy, um, which, is, which, which is dangerous, or it's been used as an alternative to democracy. 
And actually what Pakistan needs, it was founded as an Islamic state in 1948, it needs people to say that we can retain our private religious choices, but that we can play out a pluralism in, our, in the public realm that does justice to respect for people of different races and the most the different religions. And the most powerful thing that you mentioned, Arab Spring, I don't know if you remember, but about a year ago in Tahrir Square, there was a, a, a feature on the TV, a woman in a burqa, very religious woman. And she said, um, look, I'm here to assert my own personal dignity. But I know that if I want to assert my own personal dignity, I have to assert the dignity of the person standing next to me who doesn't want to be religious. And I thought that was a very powerful and moving way of saying, and I actually went to Egypt last October and met an organization called Life Makers. It's a, a voluntary organization that's doing um, uh, work against illiteracy and drug abuse in rural Egypt. 37% of the Egyptian population are illiterate, and they're trying to uh, tackle that. And there were, this is an organization that crosses the secular religious divide. And, and they were saying, look, this is about pluralism and the integrity of the person. I thought that was very, very powerful. So basic, my, my short answer is that I think it's, uh, it's, it's positive. I think there's someone else up here. Yeah, lady. Um, I was wondering what you think the implications will be thank you, um, of the rise of Qatar on East-West relations. And if you could comment on the opening of the embassy as well. Yeah, I mean, look, this, is, this is why the world is an amazing place. This place is an amazing place. I mean, talk about an asymmetrical world. You know, in 2001, Al Qaeda, a non state organization, convulsed the most important country, the biggest country in the world. Uh, you've got, in, in business, Wikipedia, an, a, an organization of hobbyists, drives Microsoft out of the encyclopedia market. Fifteen years ago, Microsoft said, we're going to, we're going to replace the Encyclopedia Britannica with 4,000 scholars who we're going to pay to produce the best encyclopedia in the world, the most up-to-date. It's going to be just, you know, Professor Andrew Gamble is going to be writing for, uh, for us. Blah, blah, blah. We're going to have the best people in the world. And they, they've gone out of business, Microsoft, because a group of people around the world who, who do it as a hobby without payment have created Wikipedia. That's an asymmetric world. But your, your, your point is an asymmetric world as well. Qatar is a population of 150,000, 200,000. Uh, one of the smallest countries in the Middle East, one of the richest countries in the Middle East, has made it a sort of made itself a pivotal player in the Middle East. How? Really interesting. Reason number one is not its wealth. Reason number one is its, its openness. It's the home of Al Jazeera. It, in a leaderless Middle East, Al Jazeera has become the leader of the Middle East. And so Qatar has made itself an absolutely pivotal uh, a player. Now, I, don't, I think that partly reflects the leadership crisis in Saudi Arabia, um, Egypt is not playing the role that it used to, etc. There, there are other things going on. But I think it's, get, it's using soft power in a really clever way. And you mentioned this, I don't know if everyone picked up, the opening of the office. This is a reference to the fact that the Taliban have opened an office in, uh, in Qatar. I think it's a really good thing. I was arguing for it a long time ago. Uh, the only way to get any stability in Afghanistan is a political settlement involving all of the peoples of Afghanistan, including the vanquished from post-2001. Um, so the more, the more talks, the, more, the better, really, and it's an incredibly urgent thing. So uh, I think there's soft power there that, that, that they're using. Well, and remember, they've got the World Cup in 2018. This isn't a short-term thing. Who's next? Yeah. Could you give us your assessment of the Libya mission last year and then related to that, um, what should be done in Syria right now? So if you were in power right now, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, uh, Libya um, is not a sort of, it isn't really a test case for anything because it's such, a, such an extraordinary situation. Uh, I think that, basically, I think the government got it more right than wrong in, uh, in Libya. I mean, if you think back to the question that was asked by this gent here, you know, you, 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 people often say to me, well, why was it okay to have military intervention in Libya, but not in Syria? Let's, let's uh, address that. And I would say there are three tests that you apply for military intervention on humanitarian grounds. Is there a pressing humanitarian need? Libya, yes. Syria, yes. Is there a viable military plan? Libya, yes. Syria, no. Are there geopolitical consequences in either case, Syria, no, 
Uh, Libya, no. Syria, yes. So essentially, you've got, you tick each of the boxes in the Libyan case, and if you can do good, you should do good. And I mean, there are some dangerous things going on related to the question I was asked about political Islam, so I don't want to, I'm not glossing that over at all. And some of the issues about the people, what were the, who were the people who are current, some of the people currently rising up in Libya, who were they allied with 10 years ago? Some very bad people. Um, but I think that there was a real and proximate threat to 15 to 30,000 lives in Benghazi, and if you can save 15 to 30,000 lives, you should, uh, really. Now, the Syrian situation, everybody I talk to says that Assad is going to go. Um, very few people know what's going to come next. The support for the Arab League is definitely the right thing to be doing, because it's got to be, it can't be an external uh, creation, although don't be under any, you know, you may think the European Union's weak. I mean, the Arab League is not a, is a very much an institution in embryo, rather than a, a, a strong federation at all. I think that the um, <coughs> threats of ICC and other, International Criminal Court and other judgments against people around the Bashar al-Assad are right. I would say this, though, I, I fear we're in a situation where um, Assad is, is convinced himself that he's either going he's to win or die. I don't see an exit route for him. And the, the Alawis in Syria are going to be very worried about their position, so are the Sunnis. It's a very, very explosive um, cocktail there. And the weakness of the other regional powers it creates a little vacuum where people talk about a civil war. And uh, I think that um, the Iranians are, are obviously big players in this, because if um, but they fear that if Assad goes, then that's their ally, <coughs> and they're going to be piling everything into Iraq then, which is, has its own uh, consequences. But in terms of your question, is the West doing what it could be? I think it is going to the UN Security Council, it's trying to support the Arab League. Those are the right things to do. Yeah. Um, what you said about the, just leave that to yeah. You know, we said about two things that um, parties need to do in order to be re-elected to learn from their defeat and have new ideas. Yeah. And given also that um, it's unmistakable that your brother is not doing well in the polls at the moment, um, is he right person to be there? Well, that's an easy question, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> is it? So it seems to be the, the logic of those two things. Yeah, look, he, it's, 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 easy, it's, it's easy to answer because, yes, he is the right person because he won the election. And the poll that matters is the one in three years' time. And I think that he's playing a long game. He's determined to set out what he believes, which I think is the right thing to do. You've got to have authenticity in politics these days. I think that he's um, leading the party in a way that speaks to his convictions, which I think is the right thing to do. He's not being overly uh, tactical about it. I think that's the right thing to do. And obviously, I'm biased because he's my brother, so I'm sort of, you know, I want him to succeed. Um, but I think that that is you know, that's the fairest answer. So, yes, he is the right person, and um, the judgment that counts is the one of the electorate in, in three years' time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you want to be ladies first, but I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, just picking up uh, on, more on the idea side rather than on the personality side. Um, I remember when you ran for leader, you mentioned that uh, one of the people they partly admired most was Tony Crosland, who uh, in 1956 wrote The Future of Socialism. And so he was sort of dealing with this crisis in the Labour Party where you know, we, we lost uh, to, to the Conservatives after a really uh, important first Labour government. Um, and there was this issue about um, the, the sort of the, all this gentrification of, of British politics, the rise of absolute standards of living, you no longer sort of saw the, the dialects between the you know, working middle class as it, as it once was. Um, and so he presented a sort of a, few, you know, a real outlook for socialism. Um, it, in the kind of crisis now that we face with you know, uh, the crisis of capitalism that came about um, in the last five years or so, um, and this, this point that you made about sort of inter interconnected world, the globalised world, um, who's, to, who's doing the thinking now? I mean, there's other, other people that you can point to now who are saying they're, they're presenting a real case for social norms, social democracy uh, in the 21st century uh, in this sort of new global environment. Well, I think that's a really, really important question. I think what's happened is really interesting in that since 
in 1956, philosophically, the left was weak because you had Hayek, you had Oakeshott, you had a much stronger sort of philosophical tradition, but the left was split between people who were tempted by uh, communism and thought the Soviet Union was the way forward, it, it still hadn't got over its, it, it was stuck really. There was, in later years, well, so in, in, in thesis, in 56, the left was weak philosophically, but was strong programmatically, stronger programmatically. Now, the left is stronger philosophically. You just have to think about a Marc Yassin, Walzer, Rawls. I mean, there's a real richness of uh, progressive philosophy, but there's a weakness of policy. And that is the, I think that's quite, I, I mean, I haven't thought about it in those terms, but just thinking about the, the comparison, I think that's kind of an interesting thought. Professor Gamble will tell me if I get a B minus for that uh, essay. But um, I think it's kind of interesting. What happened is that you had, I mean, my dad was part of this, Post, in the 60s and 70s, you had a, a sort of Marxist, independent Marxist um, movement develop, but you also had this sort of Rawlsian, Walsarian philosophical uh, basis. Now, I think that the financial crash is important, really, because it creates a new sort of baseline that is imprinted on the popular memory. And in the short term, it's been successfully blamed on the weakness of government. On the, on the weakness of government. I think. In the medium term, it will also raise very profound questions about how markets are managed. And I talk about moral markets. And I think that the argument we have to make is that it's both more efficient as well as more virtuous to have moral markets rather than immoral markets. Now, the strategic question of how you do that internationally as well as nationally, I think, is really, really tricky. Um, but my own view is that, notwithstanding its problems in the short term, the EU is going to make a comeback over the 5 to 15 year horizon rather than the 1 to 5 year horizon. I think what's going to happen is that essentially every country in the world needs to secure its own neighbourhood. The idea that you can be, you can exist in the modern world just with bilateral relations around the world, or you know, if you're Britain with the Commonwealth or something, that's not going to work. And you know, America's trying to secure its neighbourhood in the Pacific, China obviously is trying to secure its neighbourhood, I think European countries are going to want to secure their neighbourhood, and if we want to be part of the international debate, we're going to have to do that. So I think the EU, the logic of regional actors coming together, I think it's going to happen in Africa. African economic development is going to need much more, uh, much stronger intra-African trade, and that's going to take intra-African uh, regulation. So I think that uh, I'd actually put some. I'd say the EU will make a comeback in the, in the medium term domestically. <laughs> I think that this comes down to a sort of triangle of three things, really. It's about how do you empower people to make choices about their own lives, which is a different role for government. How do you protect people from risks that they can't control, and sort of social insurance for long-term care becomes a big thing. And then the third issue is the one you raised. How do you form a, a modern, respectful community at a time when you've got much more transient populations and quite high levels of migration? Those are the three big issues of politics. And actually, I think those are, if you think about them as empowerment, security, and belonging, I think the, the left is actually going to have quite a lot to say if we can do the policy work and if we can face up to the hard choices. If we just do the reassurance that we were always right, well, that's not going to work because uh, the world's just changed so much. You've already asked once, so that's a bit fair. Yeah, come back. Uh, what is the future of survival? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, are you, an, are you like professor of Somalian studies or something? Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, what, what do I think? Well, first of all, I think there's a very, there's potentially a very interesting future for Somali land. Part of Somalia, Somali land, is effectively governing itself, um, and. It's, it's not part of the convulsions that are hitting the rest of Somalia. Um, for the rest of uh, Somalia, I mean, the only part that is in the least bit, we haven't even got an embassy there. You know, there's a small part of Mogadishu that is the international community has any engagement with. I mean, President Sharif definitely has one of the most difficult jobs in the world, and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nightmarish situation. Um, I think that, um, and the truth is, I don't know what is the what's the answer to me, because 
I mean, it, its neighbor, its neighbor, it, it, its neighborhood is so conflicted. Um, its internal uh, governance is so ghastly. I mean, it's a. It, I don't. Know. What do you think the answer is? Well, you're you're very, you're a man of good judgment because uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's a not, I mean, I remember. You see, we were in a. In 2008, there was an issue, you know, could you drone your way out of the problem? If you drone, if you, if you hit the Shabab from the air, would that sort it out? I never believed that myself. Uh, I think that would have made the problem worse, probably. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, 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 I really don't. It's, a, it's fiendishly difficult. Don't know. Dennis Eichner from the City Labour Party. Um, David, I think one of the things that some Labour Party members have been most proud of in the last government was the response to the Men of Poverty Industry campaign um, and the agreements of Glen Eagles. A few years on, when um, many other countries seem to be backsliding from that and all the people think the Millennium Development Goals are under threat, how do you think we can recapture what well, I think is a great outburst in moments in this country when people really want to do something about the global problems we face? That's interesting. I mean, I, I think that um, the, the real answer to that is to say to people, you can really make a difference. That's actually the lesson of the, not just the increase in aid, but the good governance reforms, some of the conflict prevention, um, notwithstanding the situation in Somalia, um, some of the trade that's been opened up. And I think that when you, uh, Bill Gates came to address the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, last week, and what's impressive is that um, concrete goals for the elimination of some diseases it can be realised. I just want to say one other thing that I think is really different, and that, that people often worry, and, and there is a debate in Britain, should, you know, should, can we afford it, and all of that, and there's, there's definitely a bit of a pushback now. I mean, it's easy <coughs> to the middle class to say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's good that part of my taxes go on there. People are really <coughs> struggling to say, how can we afford it? One big change, and I didn't know this until uh, last year, remittances from Africans back to Africa are three times the level of global aid flows to Africa. I mean, that is amazing. For, for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's only one-to-one, -one, but even Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a one-to-one -one match of, global remitt of remittances to global aid. So in other words, Africans are taking <coughs> some charge of this. And I think that is a really good rejoinder to the people who just say, oh, look, either we can't afford it or you're throwing good money after bad. <coughs> it isn't just about transfers of Western money. It's actually about economic development now, six, seven, eight percent in, uh, across Africa. And Africans, both in Africa and in the diaspora, are taking a lot of responsibility for it. And I think that's the way to give people confidence. It's more complex, because it's not just about spend more money. But I think it's also got real, it speaks to people's sense that there has to be mutual, mutual responsibility. Yeah. Hi, um, I was just wondering, you know, given the recent events in Libya, um, how, and you oversaw one of the closest periods between the British government and the Gaddafi. How do you evaluate your time as Foreign Secretary with regards to Libya, and do you have any regrets? And what's amazing is how little we had to do with uh, Libya. I mean, in 2003, my predecessor, Jack Straw, uh, helped organise the, um, the, 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 the dismantling of all the WMD in Libya, and there were WMD in Libya. Uh, but what's remarkable about my time as Foreign Secretary is how little we had to do with them. We, we dealt with them, uh, they were on the Security Council for part of it, they chaired the Security Council for part of it, so we had to deal with them uh, in that way. But actually, uh, I mean, I'm scratching my head for, for much that we did with them at all. Um, I think that, in truth, the, uh, um, the, the, the renunciation of uh, WMD was, we, we pocketed rightly, but there were, there were obviously a whole load of other deep issues there that we didn't uh, dig into. And the fact that uh, Libya was taken out of the sort of international terrorism network was a, was a massive thing. Remember, they were the biggest supporters of the IRA, suppliers of the IRA. Um, but actually, in terms of my own time, it was, it was, it was very limited. We, probably, you know, we, we should probably have done more on you know, human rights related issues in Libya. And I'm sure they feature, if you go back to the, every year, the Foreign Office produces a human rights report. I'm sure Libya was in there, but it, it wasn't it wasn't centre stage really at all. Yeah, so. Uh, well, uh, the two state subversion uh, violence, uh, what also to the global 
anxiety in the Jewish um, state about a greater um, Israel and how should the Prime Minister reconcile the uh, political dissatisfaction with those desires? Mm -hmm. <coughs> the, 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 the Israeli Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I am, I mean, he, the gentleman there is depressed about Somalia. I am very, very depressed about the situation for the Palestinians. I mean, this is the biggest diplomatic failure in 40 years. And it's the biggest failure because in, on Somalia, I don't know what the answer is. But on uh, the two-state solution, I do know what the answer is. And most people on both sides agree what the answer is. And the failure to, to, to engineer the steps to deliver a Palestinian state is just an absolute, tra it's, a, it's, it's worse than a tragedy actually. Um, I, I think that there are only two things that are going to make this happen, and I, I wouldn't want to be forced into a corner and ask, you know, do you think in your lifetime it's going to happen, because I wouldn't be able to give a very confident answer to that. But there are only two things that are going to make it happen, both of which are very, very difficult at the moment. One is, you've got to regionalise the solution in the sense that a Palestinian state has to be part of a wider reconciliation between the Arab world and the uh, Israelis. I mean, you, you often hear people confusing Israel-Palestine with Israel, they call it the Arab-Israeli conflict sometimes, rather than the Israel-Palestine conflict. Actually, you can't resolve Israel-Palestine unless you get security for Israel and recognition of Israel from the 22 states of the Arab world. And obviously that regional agenda is completely it is not the focus at the moment because you've got all the, you've got this massive change going on within the Arab world. So their eye is on another ball. And the, the second thing that's necessary is you can't just have the Americans brokering the solution. Sorry for those of you who are American here, but uh, I mean American domestic politics makes it impossible for that role to be played by America alone. You can't do it without America, but if it's just America that's brokering this, it's not going to get done. And so you have to internationalise the effort. Funnily enough, in, or not funnily enough, ironically enough, in 1991, under first President Bush, the Madrid conference was an international conference, which the Americans supported. And so I think the only way out is regional and international. One of the most worrying things going on at the moment, though, is Israel, which until recently has been the only democratic society in the Middle East, query Lebanon, but has been, other than Lebanon, the only democratic society in the Middle East. And it was founded as a Jewish and democratic state, so rights for all its uh, citizens. It's really worrying that you've got bills going into the Israeli parliament in passing that restrict NGOs, that erode some of the civil and political freedoms that actually founded Israel in the first place. And I think that's, that, that's really dangerous, actually. That sits along, so you've got, you've got illegal settlements, that's one thing, and then you've got the danger of domestic, almost repression, right? and that's dangerous as well. I, mean, I think there are two reasons why you know, people I incredibly admire in India, a fantastic democratic country, worry about Western invention. Two reasons. You said one of them, which is the ulterior motive. I think a bigger one is they think we'll screw up. That's actually the biggest reason. And they, you know, without wishing to go into it, they, there are things that they can, there are, there are uh, interventions they can point to that uh, support their thesis. Um, now, I, I would say a couple of things about that. One, intervention is not just about military intervention. Remember the aid programs that we were talking about, that's intervention. Trade is intervention. Conflict intervention is, is intervention. Democracy building. When I, when I uh, authorised or created um, Farsi TV, which is a BBC TV service, um, providing independent news into Iran, that's intervention. But it's a sort of soft power intervention. Well, I don't know. I mean, but, but India has tremendous soft power, actually. If you look at Indian intervention in Africa, which is real, it's about soft power, it's about markets, it's about trade relationships, not to be neglected at all. Now, the ulterior motive thing, I mean, I think that, I actually think, it's, I put it slightly differently, what, what we're accused of is hypocrisy. And 
Those who say, if you solved the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israel-Palestine conflict, you wouldn't have any extremism in the world, are wrong. Right? But you get yourself out of a lot of the allegations of hypocrisy that arise when humanitarian issues arise elsewhere in the world. And so I think there's a hypocrisy question, slightly different from the ulterior motive uh, question. I mean, some people say, oh, you know, you're just doing this because of oil or something else. Uh, I don't think that's terribly... It's actually, if you look at what the Chinese are doing in Africa, that's much more related to resources. Um, so I think there's a hypocrisy issue. We've got 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah. Okay, because I have to get, I have to go and vote yeah, right uh, in my five minutes. I think I will. Yeah. Presidents of so let's take three. We'll take two groups of three questions. Is that fair? But quick answers. Three at the back. That'll be very quick. Ladies first. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on how you think the situation in North Korea is going to change, and there's a there's a possibility that there's a conflict between North Korea and North Korea. Good. Um, North Korea, um, I actually think there's a chance. There is a chance. I mean, everyone says this 27-year-old guy, what an impossible situation. He's never been outside. He doesn't know what. That's the big opportunity. <laughs> that is the big opportunity because actually, what, what's happened in Burma shows how close society is that the penny can drop about the way uh, the future. So, so I mean, I, it's. It, I'll be in China, actually, in the end of February, and I'm going to meet some people to talk about this, but it's not impossible that actually this is the best thing that's happened to North It's not impossible. Uh, National Security Council, this is the, um, there's, a, there's a sort of weekly meeting of the principal secretaries of state. And essentially, we did that, but in a much more ad hoc way. So I think it's a good thing that they've done. Um, I mean, I, don't th I think it's odd. You, you often hear the current foreign secretary say, you know, one of the greatest things we've done is set up a national security council, and you sort of think, yeah, I mean, okay. I, I always say, it reminds me of someone who um, admires their, who spends so much time polishing their Rolls Royce, they never drive it. Anymore. <laughs> so, uh, um, it's basically a good thing, and um, I'm sure it's here to stay, uh, really. Now, green technologies, I think this is a really big thing, because if you remember at the beginning, I said there were four forces that were reshaping the world, one of which is a shift from resource <coughs> scarcity to resource plenty, from resource plenty to resource scarcity. And how we feed and support a world of 9 billion people is the pressing issue for this generation. Now, there is a, th th this partly speaks to the question that this fellow asked about, what, about what's, what's the role of the centre-left, what's the role of government. See, the current, and it comes out on this green issue very, very strongly, the current Chancellor of the Sheker says, Britain shouldn't be an inch further forward on environmental regulation than any other country in Europe. Because if we are, we're going to bankrupt the industry. And I think this is so wrong as to be really worrying, actually, that he believes. It's almost as worrying as, he, as, as, as the fact that he doesn't seem to have ever read Keynes and thinks that you can grow an economy by contracting it. But the, uh, th this green issue, <coughs> see, if we don't set the long-term incentives for business clearly, then all the innovation is going to take place in China. One of the things I did when I was environment secretary was legislate that every new house uh, built after 2016 would be zero carbon. It had to generate as much energy as it, uh, it had to generate electricity as well as uh, spending it, and if it was going to, unless it did it only in a zero carbon way. And what the current government does, they said, oh no, this is bureaucratic regulation. So they've, they've exempted all sorts of things from this zero carbon standard. And some of the biggest complaints are from the house builders who are saying, hang on, we had a nine-year trajectory to get this zero carbon. We were innovating like crazy, we were driving down prices, and now all that's gone for north. And the truth is we're going to end up buying from Germany, Denmark, or, or, or uh, China, which China now has 45% of the global solar panel market. So it's a really, really important area that it, it completely breaks this idea that either you're for regulation or you're for innovation. The truth is, if you want real innovation, you have to set the incentives right in terms of pricing and regulation for, for business. And I, I think that's, this is a massive, massive thing. Last three questions. Very unfair, isn't it? At the back. Two, two, two ladies in the back. Okay. Far away. Okay. Um, I'm, I fear that under the Blair and Graf, the um, economically uh, working class were systematically 
ignored, misunderstood, and um, demonised, really. And I wondered whether you felt the Labour were going to realign themselves with people who fundamentally Labour was set up to uh, represent. And if not, then who is going to represent that group of How you deal with the government of Madina's problem, I suppose? Oh. <laughs> Um, so let me, let me start at the, the end. I mean, I think, look, talk about a democratizing wave around the world. If you'd said to me, if I'd been here six months ago and you'd said, do you think there'll be a, a Moscow Spring? I'd have said, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be very brave to uh, do that. But doesn't it just show the amazing sort of strength of character that emerges in an open and connected world? And people in Russia, middle class but also working class, can see what the rest of the world, or large parts of the rest of the world, are taking for granted. They're traveling in the rest of the world, they're interneting, they're blogging with the rest of the world. And when, when Putin did that thing of saying, yeah, Medvedev and I, we agreed three years ago to, uh, to have a switch of presidential and prime ministerial roles, but we didn't bother to tell anyone, people just say, that's just not on. That's just not on now. Putin will win, but Russia's going to be different. And I say this to everyone. In democratic societies, the challenge of government is greater than ever before because people want more say and there's transparency. But in undemocratic countries, the bar for the exercise of power has been raised. The legitimate exercise of power has been raised. If you go to monarchies in the Middle East, if you go to places like Russia, if you go to China, they are much more concerned about public opinion than before because a more transparent world means that people know more, more educated world means that people assert their rights more. So the bar for the legitimate exercise of power has been raised, and it will carry on getting raised, I think. Um, Malvinas, look, uh, Falklands will say, the, uh, um, it's simple. The decision is for the Falklanders, and there should be no decision without them. And I, 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 it's absolutely clear to me what, that they're, they're, they're going to carry on wanting to be British. They should have good relations with uh, Argentina, but. That must be, in the modern world, it must be a self-determination principle. And trying to sort of write them out of the script is the same thing on Gibraltar. It's up to the, it's up to the people who live there. It must be. And so I think that's the, that's the um, fundamental point. Let me just end on, on your point. You see, I represent a constituency, South Shields, it's in the northeast of England. It's precisely the sort of working class constituency in some ways that you, you might have in mind. It's an ex-mining, ex-shipbuilding constituency. It used to have four mines, it had a dozen shipyards. It's got one shipyard now. And the shipyard does um, uh, offshore vessels, not actually ships. Uh, so first point, it's not the organized working class, it's the disorganized working class now. It's no longer people being mobilized into mass uh, workplaces. The nearest big workplace, well, the nearest big workplace is the hospital, it's got 5,000 employees, and the public sector organization. The nearest private sector mass employer is Nissan which is a big employer, it's in uh, Sunderland, outside Sunderland in Washington. Now, so first point is it's a disorganized working class. Secondly, I don't, I mean, I don't want to go into sort of uh, uh, labor rant mode, but the, I will, but the, uh, you know, I saw in my constituency people who hadn't got the minimum wage getting the minimum wage. I saw people who were living in substandard housing getting decent housing. I saw the, if you like, the social wage, <laughs> of what people could earn, the employment they could have, including especially for women. When I arrived there in 97, the women's unemployment rate and the lone parent unemployment rate was absolutely massive. Now, I think the women, or at least until the recession, the, the, the women's, women's employment rate was up to, uh, to 65% in South Shields, below the national average, but nonetheless, massively increased. So I saw, I saw a big change. Now, equally, um, and, and what's happened over the period of the welfare state since, since 1945 is that people used to think that democratic suffrage would mean the working class parties would always win. What's happened is that working class people have become middle class. And the great success of the welfare state was to increase the size of the middle class. Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a working class anymore. There is, there's a, both a working class and a non-working class. And I would say very clearly it is for the Labour Party to stand up for them, but we won't stand up, we have to stand up for them in a way that does justice to what their concerns really are, which are about employment, housing, and opportunities for their kids. And often you hear people say middle class people are worried that their children are not going to have opportunities that they have. There's no greater aspiration for a working class person than that their kid becomes middle class. And if those supply routes are cut off, then the society has a real problem. 
With a society that can't grow its middle class, two bad things happen. One, it loses its economic motor, because the middle class spends, and it loses its political ballast, because the middle class provides political ballast. It provides a political center of gravity in any uh, society. And one of the things that I've learned over the last, well, especially over the last 18 months, since uh, you kind of referred to the events of 18 months ago, uh, one of the things I've learned over the last 18 months, that I spent the first 15, 20 years of my time in politics trying to work for, if you like, government for the people. I worked to make the Labour Party electable. I was in some, something called the Social Justice Commission, which was mentioned that was 92, 94, to help us recover from the defeat in 92. Um, but it was government for the people. One of the things I've learned is unless you get more, unless we in the Labour Party get more serious about government by the people, we're not going to succeed. And the biggest lesson in South Shields is you've got to involve people more in reshaping their own lives. You can't just do it for them. And one of the things I've done over the last 18 months is create an organisation called Movement for Change. I hope some of you go to the website, movementforchange.org.uk. It's a, an organisation for training community leaders in we're training 10,000 community leaders in the next four years. And the idea is very simple. When Labour is out of power nationally, it has to mobilise the resources of the Labour Party to help people change their own lives locally. And some of the most moving stories are of what working class people saying, government passed me by, but now I'm really making a difference in my own community. And it's about employment or crime or wealth or even housing. And I think that's a, a really important thing. Um, as I, I think I said that the beginning part of my job today is to support what Labour students are doing in the university, which is to ensure a living wage is paid for the people who are doing the security and the cleaning on the campus. I think it's a really good campaign, whatever party you're in, whether you're Labour or not, supporting the college and the university paying a living wage, which is above the minimum wage, is a really important thing. There's a Facebook site of uh, Labour students that's worth uh, doing that. The other thing is to try and bridge the gap that exists between politics in Westminster and politics as it should be and as it's debated around the country. Uh, if you've enjoyed this, you can follow me on Twitter, D. Miliband. Uh, there's one incentive for that. There's one incentive, um, other than finding out that my son was dressed up as Batman yesterday when he went to school, breaking the school uniform policy. The, um, a lot of you did wanted to ask questions and didn't have time. If you um, were trying to ask a question and couldn't, if you text me some questions, I, I promise I'll answer two or three of the easy ones on the train, uh, uh, on the train home. But it is a way of keeping the conversation going. Thank you very much indeed. to Andrew and, of course, to David. Um, we hope to see you at the Union soon, and if we could just give them, give them a final round of applause. Thank you very much.